something you like to I chose to be here. This was my choice. At least, I think it was. Most of you will believe that you chose to watch this video. We do worry about manipulation by the media and by advertising and by other people and so on. You freely willed it. What is the degree of freedom that you give to this definition of free will? Our choices define us. So if that's what we're talking about, then we don't have free will. But reality may not be so simple. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> In the early 80s, Benjamin Libet designed an elegant experiment to help us understand the mechanism of decision-making in the brain. This is the Libet experiment. All I have to do is watch... ...the spinning dot and click a button whenever I feel like it. Then report to the scientist at what time I felt the urge to click. Meanwhile, my brain activity is being monitored. Most of us would assume that our choices register as an increase in brain activity and result in us clicking the button. But what's actually observed is a build-up of brain activity, called the readiness potential, a full second earlier than the conscious urge to click. This has been replicated hundreds of times. What are the implications of this kind of experiment? So the folk's definition of free will is that your mind controls your body, meaning that your mind is free to decide what to do and send the commands to your body. But when you consider the Libet experiment, it means that conscious intentions, instead of being the cause of uh, motor preparation, is the consequence of an antecedent brain activity. So it challenges this dualistic view of mind-body causation. And so in my group, you know, we've gone back and redone all the Libet experiments very carefully, and we find that you get a readiness potential even in the absence of a motor act like doing this versus that, if a person expects something to happen. So my own uh, guess is that the readiness potential is tied up with expectation or anticipation that something is about to happen. Perhaps. So, uh, in fact, at the moment, it's very difficult to know the exact way of, I mean, how it works exactly. The experiment is over. My mind is no longer the controller. Rather, it's firmly seated in my conscious brain, guiding and responding to whispers from my subconscious. Right. I'm hungry. I need some food. If you assume, you know, there's only natural things in nature and there's nothing supernatural, well, events in the brain, including those events that lead to your conscious deliberations, have to have preceding events that perhaps were not conscious. But that doesn't mean that those events are causal. But uh, probably we can say that a lot of our decisions, even not all our decisions are the result of a prior brain activity. And as an example, there is an elegant study by the team of John Dylan Haynes, who showed that by using uh, neuroimaging measurements with MRI scanner, you can actually predict what will be the decision of participants before they are actually conscious of having taken that decision. This begs the question, how can we have free will if our unconscious brain is making decisions before we do? Oh, okay, so let me get to the issue of the unconscious. So I, I, have, I don't deny that uh, unconscious processes affect uh, the decisions that we make. But the unconscious is not unintelligent. The unconscious guides us in ways which is itself responsive to reasons. Take the following scenario. I'm walking, over eight months pregnant, hungry, and very tired. When I listen into what my subconscious is saying, she's tired and hungry too. Strangely, she wants beans for lunch. Sometimes we're influenced badly by unconscious reasons, there's no doubt about it, because advertisers do psychological experiments to find what we're sensitive to and then they set up the environment so we make decisions through unconscious subliminal influences. We know there's lots of examples of priming. Even if we start from the kind of everyday, which baked beans do I choose in the supermarket, it's sort of quite easy to get from there to a genuine worry about whether you really made that choice freely when you pick the Heinz versus the own brand or whatever it is.
fine, no beans then. Or am I just saying that because I feel my subconscious has been duped? That might be a problem, but then that happens with conscious decision making too. People lie to us. Once you start uh, sort of pushing the boundaries of manipulation, it starts to be a really hard question. When are we sufficiently in control and when aren't we? How can we step outside that and get outside those influences? Or can we even? Yeah, no. We, we <laughs> We can't. I mean, the best, the best we can do is, uh, because we're human beings and we're incredibly clever, uh, we're able to reflect on all of this stuff, right? So we're not just kind of uh, following impulse. May I add something? Okay. Go ahead. Sure. So we have to make a distinction between picking and choosing, or uh, proximal acts of uh, choosing and distal acts of choosing. That is, decisions that require less effort, like picking oranges in the supermarket, are easily done by our subconscious, while our conscious mind can focus on more complex tasks, like whether to accept a job offer, or what to cook for a dinner party, and who to invite. I think a lot of our decision making is playing out in this internal virtual reality of our imagination. And we spend about half of our waking day there imagining this versus that. And some of those imaginings or deliberations are not terribly consequential, like whom to invite for dinner. Others are very consequential, like whom should I marry? Or what country should I live in? And I want to argue that our internal virtual reality of our imagination is where free will is uh, really active. It's not picking, as in the limit task. It's really an issue of choosing consequential decisions. Right. I'm still hungry. I'm back at the beans. But I'll take some time to avoid any unconscious bean-based biases I may have and deliberate on which to buy. If you want to call free will just our capacity to make intelligent decisions, uh, which is hugely impressive, then I have no problem with that. In that case, you'd want to say, we have lots of free will, other animals have some. Even a tiger can weigh his options, so we have this sort of first order deliberation in common with a tiger. However, in addition, humans have this sort of higher level or second order capacity to deliberate, namely to deliberate about our own future self. And here's the strange thing. I felt much freer randomly clicking buttons for the Libet test than I did when I started to overthink which can of beans to buy, or certainly any of the big life stuff, where all sorts of constraints are put upon the possible choices I can make. But within your constraints, you have a degree of freedom. What does that mean? We do have some freedom to act within the parameters given to us by nature and by our society, and then those parameters that we set for ourselves, like deciding to learn a new language, or to go to the gym, or to be, even to become a, a better person. So do we have free will? Well, it depends on what you choose to call free will. If you want it to be your mind acting independent of your body, neuroscience says, probably not. If you want your conscious self to be totally in control, again, probably not. But if you choose to locate free will in our conscious thoughts, then probably yes. Ironically, whether you choose to believe in free will or not is a question of choice. When we spoke on the phone, you said you weren't sure about free will, and now you're saying you, we, you don't think we have it. Yeah. Because I'm just waiting for additional scientific evidence. It's just that at the moment, with what we know, it's hard to really believe in free will. Uh, but perhaps uh, somebody, no matter the field in neuroscience, neurobiology, or physics, uh, will find a, a new experiment. Wait, in order to why did she say physics? Well, or not? 